In this video, we're going to implement some behavior-driven design tests in Android Studio. We're going to start with this requirement document that we created in an earlier video. And with the requirements document, we start with our, as a user, I want features so that I can do something. And then we elaborate it into a series of examples in given when then syntax. We've already done that part. So right now our job is to take these given when thens and turn them into code. So let's go into our development environment. Since we're starting a new topic and a topic that will likely take several videos to get through, let's go ahead and create a new branch. And we're going to call this one consume plant JSON because what we're really doing is we're consuming JSON from an external system. And we're going to start with our tests, our unit tests, and then we're going to write the logic to actually consume the JSON. We'll do that all as part of this branch with the first part being just writing our unit tests. So we do that, we choose OK. One other thing, when I was showing some examples in a previous video around GitHub and Git, I added a whole bunch of unit tests that are just kind of uh, not really adding a whole lot of value. They're just addition tests. Let's go ahead and clean that up and save. And the, actually, the, this test that I'm leaving, though, this one does serve a good purpose because you see what it's doing is it's testing out our data class or our DTO. And we, if you remember back to that video, if you did watch that video, we did do it in a test-driven design format. We started by writing the test, and then we came back and we created the DTO. We'll probably need to expand that DTO a little bit as part of this case, but nonetheless, it gets us off to a good start. I don't like the word example unit test because that's kind of ambiguous. Let's refactor that while we're in here. So right click refactor and rename and let's call this plant unit data unit test, something like that, and then refactor. Okay, now you notice that I have an annotation here at test. And in JUnit4 style, which is what we're using here, that's how we indicate that a method is a test method, something that needs to be tested. So we'll create a few more of those. But first, we do remember something from the overview video. There are a couple of things that we need to do here. Uh, first of all, because we're using observables, we have to add a test rule. And so I'm going to say at get rule, and then under that we'll say our rule colon test rule equals instant task executor rule. A rule with a U. And let's see, test rule. Okay. Now you see the instant task, task executor rule is not recognized. And when I do an alt enter, uh, it doesn't give me an import option. That does indicate that my build uh, needs an update. So let's take a look at our build doc radle. We'll look at the one in the app module and we'll go towards the bottom. And we need to add a new Android test implementation. Uh, so we can do like so. Uh, test implementation, that will work for the unit test that we're doing right now. If we did an instrumented unit test, which is this other example down here, we'd actually need to kind of duplicate this import. I'll go ahead and do it because maybe we will play in there at some point soon. So Android test implementation. So note that Test implementation, that says this is a library for a normal unit test, where Android test implementation says this is a library or a dependency for an instrumented test, which are the two different tests we have over here in the left side pane. So, okay, Gradle's changed. Whenever that happens, it wants us to sync. So let's go ahead and sync, and then we'll run back to our plant diary unit test once that sync is finished, and we'll see if we're able to import this instant task executor role. The Gradle build is finished, so let's go ahead and import that instant executor task role. There we go. And now this will make testing observables a little bit easier. We will get to that in just a moment, but nonetheless, good to set up now. So let's start with our first requirement. Given a feed of plant data is available, when I search for Redbud, then I should receive at least one result with these attributes. So we go back to our test class now and let's say at test that's easy to forget so let's go ahead and do it right up front now let's make a function with a, a descriptive name so search for redbud 
returns red bud. Open curly, close curly. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create the methods that match given a feed of plant data is available when I search for red bud, then I should receive these results. So given a feed of plant data are available, and data is plural, so I might as well make that are available, not is available. Then we'll say when search for red bud, then result contains eastern red bud. Now you'll notice that I'm invoking methods that haven't been created yet. I'm going to let the IDE do a bit of work for me. So Alt Enter and Create, and that creates our then. Alt Enter and Create, and that creates our when. And finally, Alt Enter and Create, and that creates our given. You notice I did that bottom to top, reason being whenever we have the IDE create a new method, it typically will do it directly underneath the method we're currently in. So by doing it bottom to top, they actually appear in a more logical order. So given a feed of plant data are available, when search for red bud, so on and so forth. Okay, given a feed of plant data are available, we're going to get that from our view model. So we need to uh, instantiate our view model. So we will say um, MVM equals main view model. I know we haven't looked at that main view model yet, but that's part of what we're doing here is we're testing out this main view model. Now, this variable needs to be available in multiple methods. So you notice that I just kind of assigned a variable here on line 36, and I've not yet declared that variable. Well, that's because I want to declare the variable kind of like as an attribute or a field, something that's declared here at the top of the class so it's visible in all methods. So. Let's say var, because we know var is how we declare variables in Kotlin, uh, var mvm, which is the name of that variable that I referenced down below. Now, in Kotlin, we know that we can use var as a variable type, but we can also give a more specific type if we wish at the time of declaration. And that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to have a colon and then say main view model. And what I'm saying here is that the variable mvm is a variable of type main view model. Okay, now it's giving me a red line. Uh, property must be initialized or be abstract. So initialize would be something like equals main view model. That would satisfy things, but eh, that's kind of dirty to do out here. We really should just be declaring things out here. Really, the initialization is something that feels like it should be done in a given function. So what we can do in Kotlin is say late init. And what that says is, okay, I realize that this variable MVM will not be initialized now, but it will be initialized before it's used. And at that point, we'll learn a little bit more about it. You see that takes the red line away. And down here in our given a feed of plant data are available, red line is gone again. So now let's look for when search for red bud. In this case, we'll say plants red bud. Now, I mentioned we haven't seen this view model yet, so we don't know what's in there. And this is interesting as well because you notice that we're calling a method that doesn't exist. That's okay. This is test-driven development. Uh, we are allowed to do that. We're allowed to call methods and then make them later. But, of course, we have to make them later. We have to follow up on that next step. Okay. Now, the then part is what's going to be a little bit complicated because we have a little bit of nesting going on here and a little bit of Kotlin syntax as well. So first of all, let's start simple. var redbud found equals false. You notice in this case, I didn't have to give it a type because false is by default a Boolean. And so Kotlin recognizes, okay, that's a Boolean. I know what it is. Now, down here towards the bottom, I'll say assert true redbud found. Now at the moment, that would always fail, right? Because there's no time when we're switching this red bud found from false to true. So now what we want to do is we want to give that ability. So mvm.plants.observe forever. Okay, now plants is an attribute that does not yet exist on our view model. When we make it, that will essentially be live data. 
Observe forever. Okay, now we have a couple of shortcuts here, especially if you're more used to Java syntax. You notice we kind of have a dot notation going on. Uh, and also notice that these are kind of like attributes or variables, but they don't look like methods. In the land of Kotlin, instead of calling get plants, you can just shortcut that by saying dot plants. Uh, so these things that would look like methods in Java don't always look like methods in Kotlin. Now on top of that, observe forever means I want to look at this data forever, as long as the program is running. What do I want to do when I look at the data? Well, open curly and close curly and here is where we do the observing. So again, kind of an interesting syntax if you're used to Java. Uh, several things going on here. So first of all, one interesting thing about Kotlin is that if you're in an iteration loop, uh, you can use this IT as a shortcut. That represents whatever variable you're iterating over. That's usable in a few other syntaxes as well, and this is one. So I'm going to say assert not null IT, and that's just saying, did we get something back? And then we'll say assert true IT size greater than zero. So did we get a collection back and is that collection not empty? Just a couple basic tests. Now, uh, because IT in this case represents a collection, and uh, by the way, what collection does it represent? It represents a collection of plants that have been parsed out of JSON. Well, since IT represents that collection, we can invoke a shortcut on that for each. You can think about a for each loop in Java. Uh, you typically have a for each and an open paren and a whole bunch of stuff, and then an open curly, close curly, so on and so forth. In the land of Kotlin, uh, if you're on a collection, you can just do dot for each and then open curly, close curly, and then it's going to iterate over that collection. Now, one trick from here is we're now within another loop, aren't we? Because notice we're within the for each loop. Guess what? We can still use that IT variable, but now it represents the iteration variable from this inner loop, this for each loop. Um, I could keep explaining it, but it's one of these things where I'll ask you to just kind of hold that thought for a moment. It will make a lot more sense when we go through the debugger. The only challenge is we can't go through the debugger until we finished both this test-driven design test, and also we've added the plumbing that makes this test pass. So that might be a couple videos ahead of this one. Nonetheless, uh, what we can do now is we can do an if test, and we can say if it.genus equal equal sursis and then we'll say and it dot species equal equal canadensis and it dot common we'll say contains eastern redbud reason being uh, think of an apple fuji apple honeycrisp apple jazz apple they're all apples right uh, very similar. Rest, red buds come in many different flavors. The most common is the Eastern red bud. Uh, you see quite a bit in Cincinnati. Very easy to recognize in uh, mid-March, early March, because it's an early bloomer, makes a lot of purple flowers. Uh, it's one of the first trees you see in bloom. Nonetheless, uh, you can have a Chinese red bud. You can have a white red bud. Lots of different variants. So let's just say it has to contain the text Eastern red bud. Then we'll do an open curly and close curly. And then we'll say red bud found equals true. And now you notice that if this if test passes and we get down to this assert true, it will tell us whether or not we had a plant returned with Cercis canadensis and then Eastern red bud. Now we have another example, which is if I search for Quercus, which is the genus for oak tree, then I should get at least these two results, an English oak and a white oak. Um, I don't like a video that goes too terribly long, and I know we're almost at the 15 minute mark, so I'll tell you what, this one I might just go ahead and do offline, but the last one's pretty straightforward. The last one is just garbage data returns nothing. And as silly as that sounds, I think it's more important to test the edge cases than the happy path. Uh, the edge cases, are, you know, those are the things that you don't tend to pay attention to a lot. So let me go ahead and write a test for that. Shouldn't take too long. Uh, part of the reason is I get to reuse some things. So let's say at test, and then we'll say uh, fun 
search for garbage returns nothing. Again, a, a descriptive function name, reason being if this fails or if something goes wrong, you can tell exactly what failed because the function name tells you what's failing. Now, here's why it is a bit faster this time around, because notice, given a feed of plant data are available, that's common across both of my tests, no problem. Uh, then I can say, when I search for garbage, okay, that one will be new, but easy to replicate, then I get zero results. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll enter, then I get zero results, and I'll enter on when I search for garbage. Okay, when I search for garbage is going to be relatively easy. Uh, let's go ahead and, you know, just for the sake of completeness, let's go ahead and take exactly that text uh, that is in the design document, with the only footnote being that semicolon I'm a little nervous about because I can speak for what happens on this uh, test harness, but I can't necessarily speak for server-side data. So let me just paste that in just a moment. I'll tell you what, I'll take out that semicolon because it's going to make me nervous. Now I'm going to go up to the uh, when search for Redbud, and I'm simply going to borrow this and reapply a little bit. So we borrow, take out the to do, that will cause us uh, trouble when we get to um, committing and pushing, if not. And then I'm going to replace uh, fetch plants Redbud with fetch plants garbage data. Uh, now, then I get zero results. Okay, similar to what we did above, but a lot simpler. So we're going to say, mvm.plants, remember plants is our live data object, and then observe forever. And then remember open curly, close curly means this is what I do when I'm observing on this. And then also remember uh, in this type of syntax, it represents some kind of iteration variable, but in this case, it represents what we're observing, or in other words, what we're looking at. And what we're looking at is going to be a list of plants. So this assert's going to be pretty straightforward. Assert equals, and then we say zero, and then it dot size. Because if we search for garbage, we're expecting that we will get a collection back, but that collection will have nothing in it. So with that, I save, and as I mentioned, I'll go off camera and I'll do the last test, which is probably about 15 minutes of typing. So save that one off camera. Nonetheless, uh, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to, number one, make this class compile. And we're going to make it compile by implementing all the things you see here that are currently red or red lines. Uh, when we do that, we might find I might have made a syntax error here and there, so I might go back and, and uh, fix that, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. The other thing that we're going to do is make the test work. And we know that's the important part because we all got together and decided that this requirement is complete when all of these tests pass. So we can tick that box. We can say, okay, definition of done. Of course, we'll want to do code review and things like that. One small footnote here, we are using the uh, JUnit syntax and we are us using the given when then syntax. A unit test should really test only one class. And to a degree we are because we're looking at this view model and we're testing that along with the live data that's hanging off of it. But we do have a dependency on actually getting and parsing data and using a retrofit library. So there are several other things that we're going to need to do. The only trick is that blurs the line between unit test and integration test. So if we look at this specifically, absolutely, definitely still a valid test, but without actually mocking out the data feed that we're receiving and that we're parsing, I would, I would lean towards calling this one an integration test. So nonetheless, hope this has been helpful. I'm going to go ahead and commit and look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.